because I can do that. That's right. All right. Welcome, y'all, to the live edition of the Permaculture Pimp Cast, where pimp stands for permaculture is my passion. The only pimp cast on planet Earth where we discuss permaculture, preparedness, and practical living. We're going to get it all, all into it today with my guest, my special guest, and one of my friends and mentors. Before we do that, y'all, this episode is always brought to you by Hickory Ridge Soap from TwoOldCrowsHomestead.com. Turn that simp into a pimp. Bam! <laughs> Evans Harvest, also 10% off with promo code PERMA. Handle all your preparedness needs yourself, but all the things you can't source, knock it out over there at Heaven's Harvest. And if you would like to tip a pimp, go do it on the Fountain app. You can drop a derivation of, of uh, Bitcoin on there called Satoshi. I can never get it right, but I'm going to call them Sats. So if you want to drop some SATs on a PIMP, go do it over there on the Fountain app. Also, Redemption Shield, 10% off. EMP Shield, 50% off with promo code PERMA. Everything has promo code PERMA. And don't forget, also, if you'd like to get that food forced in a box, starting to get along in the tooth for that sort of thing, but go check out the TheTexasBoys.com. All right, without further ado, y'all, hey, as you're coming in, hit that thumbs up because everybody needs to hear this one. And I'm talking everybody because my man Jack Spearco from the Survival Podcast, if you don't know who, who he is, folks, you're going to want to know. If you're not subscribed to the Survival Podcast or his YouTube channel, believe me, you want to know. I'll give you a brief, before we go into Jack, let me just say this real quick, y'all. There's a whole lot of people in this space. A lot of people that are uh, more polished than spit and more glitter than grit. And Jack ain't one of them. <laughs> My man came out there one time impromptu without any preparedness whatsoever, taught a course together with me with zero preparedness, and he knocked it out of the park, and this is what he does, y'all. So he is the real deal. When I, I mean real deal, the guy that introduced me into permaculture. So, um, folks, you're going to be glad you tuned in tonight because we're going to be hitting some topics. Um, some folks are saying that we are in what Shakespeare called the winner of our discontent. Whether it is or isn't, I'll leave that up to you to figure it out. But no matter what it is, Jack's tagline for his show, and I think it's a way to live, all the way around is it, you know, it's for when times get tougher, even if they don't. So we're going to be talking about some balling stuff tonight. And I'm talking homestead composting and meat processing with my man, Jack Spearco. How you doing, Jack? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. I hope I can live up to all that. Well, actually, I kind of held it back a little bit, man, because I know you are the pimp daddy of preparedness in the modern times, especially. And, um, Man, you're doing a lot of cool stuff. I mean, right off the bat, bro, you sent me this latest course that you got going. And I'll be let me just preface it this way, bro. I have spent now I'm not I'm not gonna call anybody out. I'm not gonna say the names. Okay. But I spent I spent literally for just me alone to get a certification in a certain soil course, almost four thousand dollars. I went through the first hour of your course. And you covered the first 10 one-hour uh, segments of that course in the first hour that I listened to you. It was very concise. It was very to the point. And I'm sitting here shooting my I'm, – I'm sitting here like floored at how much you were able to put in in just an over – in just an hour presentation. So, um, man, I think you knocked it out of the park with this one. Well, um, I, I will bet that my course is far more uh, hands-on, proactive, what to do uh, than the one that you're talking about. Um, I probably know what you're talking about. Uh, and, and that course probably did get into things that mine won't. I, I won't be spending time on telling you how to use a microscope in, in my course. Um, it's not that I don't value that. It's just not what it's designed. It's a $40 course. Yeah, um, but it's about eight hours and it teaches the concept of bioreactor compost, which is, you know, I, I don't. And in that course, I, I don't know how far you got through it yet, but I make it very clear. I'm not putting down anybody else's form of compost. It's just this is a better one. Uh, it requires a lot less effort and the results are pretty amazing. I can show you your, your folks here something real quick, uh, just as an example. And I don't know if you have to add me to this. Yeah, you have yeah, to add that. There you go. Yeah, there you go. So that what you're looking at right there, that 
that is just some cuttings of a plant called longevity spinach. Uh, the plant's really not as important as what you're seeing there. The one cup to the, to the left on your screen is stuck into my compost. And the other cup is stuck into uh, a commercial potting soil. And it's not like a cheap Walmart potting soil. It's Fox Farms. If you were going to, if you came to me and said, I want to start my own seed this year. I don't have any compost. I don't want to make my own stuff. What should I buy? I would tell you Fox Farms, either Happy Frog or the Forest Soil, either one of them. They're, they're fantastic. But that's the two of them. They were stuck on the same day. They were grown out three inches apart under the same lights. I, what I do is I make cuttings of that plant every year, and I bring it in out of my garden into my shop because it won't survive the frost, and it, it reproduces from cuttings easy enough. And I made six of them, three of each, and they all look the same. And, and what you're seeing there is biology over chemistry. Um, because I promise you, if you were to do an analysis on like NPK, that Fox farm soil has more NPK than, than my compost does it, 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 in every measurable way. But what my compost has that that doesn't is a very high fungal to bacterial ratio. It's probably about a one-to-one -one ratio. And everything that I did, you can drop that down now. I just wanted to show that to your people. Everything that I did there, I, uh, I, I, I wanted just to, to help people understand that that is the most important factor in what we do with building soil fertility is getting into fungal dominance. You're not going to get into fungal dominance if your organic matter is too low, but higher organic matter without the fungal dominance won't fix your problems a lot of the times. And this was all based on the work done by Dr. David Johnson. He, he's the guy that made bioreactors very well known. Um, and did tremendous work and did all the PhD level documentation to prove that it works. The issue that I had with it is I was like, I'm not going to do it <laughs> because it was like, it was too much work or I didn't have the equipment. He uses reinforced, uh, uh concrete reinforcement, uh, welded wire. That's about five and a half foot tall. Um, he puts it on top of a pallet that makes it about six foot tall. And you got to load everything up into there. Well, if you're a farmer, you have a front end loader. That's not a big deal. You know, you can fill up the front of the front end loader and, and stand on it and knock your stuff into it. And there was just a lot of other pieces and parts to it that were designed for agriculture, not for homesteaders, not for people growing in the backyard. Uh, he, he uses a jig that holds the pipes that go into the bioreactor. And that's that's done. That's welded. So most farmers own a welder. Uh, again, most backyard homesteaders do not. So I just modified it, and but what I did, and I think you, you can attest to this because you went through chapter one at least, instead of just modifying it like so many people have done on YouTube, I understood deeply why it worked in the first place from an intellectual level and from a scientific level so that I could remove things without screwing it up. Because if you look at all these modified bioreactors on YouTube, you'll see a lot of people they build one and when they break it down a year later, it's only like half broken down. Like most of it's still not. And the way that I do it, you get a full incorporation breakdown. Sometimes you get a little bit on the very edge on the outside, but that's fine. That's just a little extra mulch. And, uh, but yeah, it, it is, is just designed for something that people can take and then immediately put into work. The only thing you have is it takes about a year to mature. So since it takes about a year to mature, you can immediately start making it, but you're going to have to wait on it. So someone like you, if you wanted to start doing it, I'm familiar with the type of composting you'd do. If you said, well, what do I do for compost this year? Keep doing what you're doing and and, and put a few bioreactors together. And, and then next year, you could start having that cycle come out. It's incredibly valuable uh, compost. No, from, from where I'm standing, I, I see so many awesome benefits in it. Um, Right off the bat, Jack, let's back up a little bit because a lot of people coming into the chat are probably going to be wondering, well, what's the difference between conventional composting and the type with a bioreactor? Because I'm going to be learning something here too. I've never, I know, I understand the concept. I understand microbially what's going on. Yep. Uh, David Johnson is a doggone genius, especially when he discovered that the correlation that we used to think between NPK and um, everything else is really not what we thought it was, especially when you get into the biological realm, but I'll let you cover all that. But why don't we just cover right off the difference 
People have seen me do 18 day compost. They saw me do the 30 day chicken tractor on steroid compost. They've seen me do Elaine Ingham's compost on Patreon. But how does this, what are the, how does this differ? So all of those methods are what I would call a high turn compost. And you get things done very quickly when you go into a high turn model because you keep rebooting everything and you get your nitrogen carbon bonds to go much more quickly. And you're doing a, a thermophilic compost all the way through. In fact, you know, it's done when it looks right, smells right and isn't warm anymore. And then really, even when you're doing that, you probably should give that compost some time to age and mature a little bit before you start applying it. What I'm doing is a static pile compost, meaning once we build the pile, we never turn it ever again until we use it. And then we're just taken from it. We're not actually turning it. And this is really important if you want to build fungal dominance into your compost. And it's also important for some other things. One thing you'll end up with is no matter what material you put into it, you're going to end up with a lower pH by, by, by doing this. So a, a high turn compost will generally have a pH of about 7.5 to 8.5. And if you're in a place with acidic soils, that's probably a good thing. If you're like me, where everything's alkaline already, you don't need any more of that. So we'll, we'll end up with our compost somewhere between 6.5 to 7.5. That's a point down. You're also going to end up with less salt. And there's a variety of reasons that are in the course, and I can only cover so much in the time we have here. So I'll just say that you will end up with less salts in your compost. Um, but the bigger thing you're going to end up with is all that wonderful fungi. So think about how fungi propagate in the soil. So they extend hyphae in the soil, and then we turn the compost. What happens to hyphae? We tear it right. apart, yeah. right? So I know, like me, you were in the army. I'm sure you remember one day that you came back from, you know, being out in the field at basic and you got into the common area. Maybe you got like four companies all together and somebody's stuff is all laying out in the common area. You're just praying to God it's not yours, right? <laughs> but it might have been yours, right? Because the drill starts going and one person screwed up and they rip the mattresses. They take the beds. They throw the wall off, like everything. It's all mixed together and you got to sort it out at midnight and you're going to be up at 430. That's how your soil microbes feel every time you rip that apart. Now, what we get out of it is speed, but we give up the complex nature of what we're doing. And if we do this the right way, we don't just end up with a high amount of fungal activity in the compost. We end up with the fungi and the bacteria, and we end up with an incredibly broad array. So we'll end up with somewhere between four and 500 species and subspecies of known beneficials. And we know that from something called metagenomic testing, which is pretty expensive to do. And this is why, thank God for David Johnson to actually do this level of research, because not everybody has USDA or NRCS throwing money at them to do stuff like this. And so metagenomic testing is they know what they're looking for. And so then they take a sample of this and they run genetic sequencing to see exactly what's in there. And this is where the maturity kicks in. So you start out at 90 days, it looks pretty good. You could use it, but it'll have 300 beneficial species at that point. But only like 20 of them will make up like 80% of the total. When we get around 52 to 60 weeks of letting this stuff mature, we're looking at like 90 to 100 species making up 80% of the bulk. And then you have all the other friends there, another, you know, 350, 400 species of beneficials. Well, one thing that's important to understand here, everybody loves talking about mycorrhizal. There'll be no, there'll be fungi there, but there won't be mycorrhizal yet because mycorrhizal fungi need a living root system. So one of the BS detectors that should just set you off immediately if somebody tells you that their compost is, that they make or they sell or whatever is full of mycorrhizal fungi, exactly. it might be full of spores, but it, it ain't got no, it has to have a living root. And that's why, like, the next course that we're working on, other we have a free one coming out probably next week, but the next paid course is going to be on cover cropping because that's kind of the next step is to get that living root in the system. But, th like, the simple assembly is you have something round. I use three foot. I call it goat fence. It's whatever kind of fence you want to call it. And I make a loop of about five and a half foot, to four, four and a half to five and a half foot diameter, depending on how much you want to make. And then the inside is lined with uh, weed blocker 
which yeah. is conveniently available in exactly the width that you need to put on that piece of fencing. And it's just a nice height to work at when you're loading it. So I make mine mostly with the stuff that comes out of my duck coop. And I usually make it once a year and I'll make like three of these bioreactors. And it's a lot of work for a weekend. I just run a class and have students come do the work, right? But but it is a lot of work for the weekend. But once you do it, all you're going to do from that point forward, there's a lot of little tricks in this, but you're going to just keep it wet until you're ready to use it next year. So you're never going to turn it again. You don't have to worry about anything other than it can't freeze solid. You don't want that. And that may happen in some climates. And then there's just the real world hits, you know, what you want. And you do not want it to dry out. Drying out is death. Drying out is going to do two things. One, you're going to lose a lot of your microbes. Two, the microbes that are capable of actually surviving the dry out are going to go into survival mode, right? And they're going to they're going to exudate some stuff that's going to coat all your compost and make it hydrophobic. And the reason they do that is they're basically saying, look, we don't want to be woken up until the rain is real. That's what happens when soils go hydrophobic. The organisms that can survive in them put a, a gel out and they coat it and it takes a, a, a heroic level of water to break that surface tension and go back into it. So everybody here has probably at some point bought a bag of potting soil and it was just as good as potting soil, you know. And, and let it aside without closing it up right. And you go back to it and it's bone dry. And you're like, ah, I'll just water it. And you throw it in a cup and you fill it up with water and the water goes right through it. And it's still bone dry. That's what's happened. Those microorganisms have gone into survival mode. So never let it dry out. Try not to let it freeze. And you don't have to do any work until you're ready to use it. Yeah, another, another crazy thing about just going on these bag soils, folks. This is why I'm so, part of why I'm so excited to have Jack on here tonight Everybody is seeing, we have record numbers. In fact, Joel Salatin's latest book is called what the homesteading tsunami. And we have record numbers of people getting into this space and they don't know where to start. So a lot of people are getting this stuff off the shelf. And if you've seen the video that we did a couple of months ago, where we tested all of the high pollutant bag soil, not one of them, we did an NPK test on each one of them. Not one of these highly touted bag soils were what they said it was. Then when we did a biological assessment on each one, what they're doing right now, Jack, is they're taking, they're giving this stuff a nematode extraction, hmm. which is basically taking a bunch of mountain lions because they're kind of a top predator in the soil food web. Okay. So they'll put a nematode extraction in there. We're finding all these nematodes, but they're bacterial feeding nematodes and there ain't no back. They're not for me. Dude, there's no bacteria. There's no fungal. So I'm like, there is no way these nematodes are in here unless they did a nematode in injection so they're doing this stuff half the stuff we couldn't barely even test it because like you said it was downright hydrophobic and you could tell almost you know how it is when you look at if you've been doing this a while you can look at compost and you can pretty much smell it look at it and you kind of know whether or not this stuff is on point yeah we haven't tested a single one in the bag that works out and folks this is why Everybody needs to tell everybody else, first of all, hit that button, the, the thumbs up and tell everybody, you know, to listen in because we're at that time where you keep, you don't even have good options to go buy right now. Some of the most highly touted stuff in our area, they're charging a hundred bucks, over a hundred bucks per cubic yard of this stuff. And it's garbage. It's not even good. So Jack, that brings me right back to you. Um, okay. So this process you're saying it takes a year. Uh, what if a person's in a bind and they got to get into it? Is that even possible or do they well, have to wait the whole year? Well, you could start pulling from it a bit early and you could certainly make an extract or a tea from it early, but you're not going to have the bioactivity and you are doing some disturbance. So if you were only taking, let's, let's say you wanted some to make potting soil or something, you know, and you needed to start a few plants, you're like, I would leave it alone. I would do what I said at the beginning. I would make a bioreactor or two. You know, you figure out your needs. And you and in my course, I give you a cheat sheet that gives you calculations to how many cubic yards or fractions of cubic yards one is. And you know you're going to lose about two-thirds of volume when you do this. And we'll get into why that's the case. And it's not direct composting that causes this. It is, it is our friends, our microbes, and our little creatures too, like worms in there that are actually feeding on things 
that brings that down. And I would make an 18, 21, 28 day high turn compost for this season. And I would, and I would really encourage you when that compost is done, keep it moist, throw a tarp on it. And I like to use even for tarping weed blockers, just you got to be more in tune with the fact you need to keep it moist. And I would give that at least a week or two to mature after it's done because it will be collecting microbes. Like part of what I've discovered in this journey is I'm learning about Korean natural farming and what they do with indigenous microorganisms or they call them IMO now, but everything I've been doing is a mass IMO capture. Instead of making these little rice cake things that we're putting in the suspension and then brewing back up, what we're doing is we're just making a massive pile. And so one of the things that I've modified over Dr. Johnson is Dr. Johnson covers the top of his bioreactors with weed blocker to, to reduce evaporation. I've got about 40 yards of wood chips aging over in my field. Once I get that bioreactor filled, and there might be wood chips mixed in with it, but it's it's mixed in with nitrogen sources from the uh, bird manure. It's, and there's some other kickers that go in there that we can talk about in a bit. But I just go over to those wood chips and I get about three to four inches of wood chips and I leave my bioreactor about three to four inches from the top, fill it with the wood chips. So I just have an inner wood chip top. And that's doing a bunch of things. One, it's a rough surface and every time the wind blows, every kind of microorganism that comes by can get captured in there and end up proliferating down through the compost over that, that year that it's maturing. The other thing, though, is you know what happens when you leave wood chips laying around. They start to get oh, colonized with fungi. And so right. when we dig out of that pile, it smells of mushrooms. So when, when we build that, we do have a thermophilic cycle and it'll run like you'll fill it up. And the next morning, it'll be like 130 degrees in the core. And if it's cold out, the pipes that you put in it to allow it to breathe will be steaming. And by the second day, it'll be 150 degrees. And it'll slowly come down from there. And it could come down to a normal temperature of about 80 degrees in 10 days or it could take 20. It all depends on your mix. Once that thermophilic cycle ends, though, that's when all of that fungal activity that's in those wood chips, it's not going to get burned up. It's going to go down into that pile and it is going to colonize the heck out of it. So Dr. Johnson's version, large scale agricultural version, is probably more perfect than what I do, but what I do has is other advantages, and that's just one example of them. I also do a lot with, I use biochar on my compost, which equally distributes the moisture because biochar holds seven and a half times its weight in water. So every time I lay down a new layer in my deep litter system in my duck coop, I throw a five gallon bucket of biochar down first. So you get a pretty even distribution of biochar in that material at the end of the season when it goes into the composter. That's kind of, and I give like all, there is not a trick I have, you know, that I left out of the course. And, and, and I, I actually held back a long time on doing a course, Billy, because it ain't that I hate money. You know that uh, it's just like, I already gave all this information out for free, but you don't realize what you're leaving out until you structure it into a course, you put exams with it. And then you realize like there's, Here's the way to look at it. It's going to seem totally unrelated. Way back in the day, I used to be in telecommunications. And my first job, I was a fiber optic technician. I used to terminate fiber optic cable. And when you terminate a fiber optic cable, you take this little tiny piece of glass, and you insert it into a ceramic, and, and you're putting something the size of a hair in there. And then you cut it with a little diamond cutter, and you pull it off. And then you have to, you have to polish it. And you use something that's like, it's like sandpaper measured in microns instead of grit. And there's like three levels that you polish this thing down. And you make little figure eights when you do it with this little disc that the tip goes in. And I, you know, I did it for two years and I'd have people come out to my job site to learn from me. And you're like, why can't this person do this? And they'd be there for 20 minutes with one connector and you pick it up and go boom, 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 boom. And you say, here, look at it in the microscope. And they're like, oh, wow. And what you don't realize is over the years of doing it, you start to develop these little techniques in your fingers. And so when you're teaching and you're just podcasting and you're just, you know, you're talking for an hour, hour and a half, and you think you've given everything, all those little manipulations, they just get left out because you didn't build, you didn't build a course, you built a one hour presentation. 
And anybody that's ever been to a seminar, no matter how good it was, knows that you can only learn so much in an hour from somebody. Yeah, but the truth of it is also whenever I was giving away butchery courses, people fundamentally think it's worth something unless you charge something. Yeah, that too. And because I'm like, okay, what you've put in here, you did it in the most concise way. Folks, I'm telling you, if you're on the fence about getting this, look, I've already been through the first hour. And like I said, it knocked my socks off because I couldn't believe Jack is very, very skilled at communication, but I couldn't believe how much he was able to put in the very first hour of this thing. And we haven't even gotten down to brass tacks on this, but he goes, he does a masterful overview of how this whole process works. And then on the heels of that, real quick, before I go into the next question, I want to answer Christina here. He's saying, can we get fungal dominance in the chicken tractor compost system? Well, I just tested some from Eric Sider. He's Jeff Lawton's right-hand man here in the States. He sent us a, um, a sample, and it came right out of his chicken tractor on steroids. It was off the meat wagon. You need to be, according to Elaine Ingham, to be, I'm just going to give you basic numbers here, but you need 135 micrograms per gram of fungus and bacteria to be biocomplete. That's just one of the numbers you got to hit. His was somewhere around 800, which is pretty doggone good. And it was almost a one-to-one -one ratio, which is fantastic for a pasture system. So it can be done, but Jack's right on the money. And this is why I think this system is so awesome is that your fungus is only, your fungus doesn't even go to work until the bacteria did its job on the thermophilic end. So the, the fungus is basically holding its place and it's like, okay, once the temperature and the moisture is right, then I'm going to go forward. Yes. And that's what I love about this process is that nobody talks about the fungal, why you need that fungal component out there in the soil. So that brings me to the next one, Jack. I mean, the year's up. They, they followed your instructions. They did what they were supposed to. The year's up. Now, what's the best way to go about using this stuff? All right, so this is where it gets really interesting. We can be spoiled with it because we're making it in our backyard, and even one of my bioreactors has about 1.7 cubic yards. Of, of the biggest ones I make have about two. Uh, so you're going to end up with, if you got two cubic yards and you're reducing by a third, you're going to end up with two-thirds of a yard in one bioreactor. That's a lot of compost. So I will routinely, every fall, when my summer gardens are, are, are ready to go, I will lay down a cover crop and I will just put about a quarter to a half inch of compost on top of the cover crop on the surface, water that in, let that cover crop produce. And then that's feeding the soil all the way through to my spring planting. And that's, that's one way to do it. However, this is not about NPK. It's not even about organic matter. We're going to build organic matter in the soil with that cover crop, with our cropping, with our intercropping, with everything we do in permaculture, we're going to build organic matter. What we're, again, it's a microbe thing, so we can use far less. The recommended application rate from Dr. Johnson on an agricultural use is 400 pounds to an acre. If you take a one-foot tile and you run a spreader that's set to do that across that tile, you'll barely see it. It's a dusting. It, to, to get it in your head, a football field plus the end zones is about an acre. And 400 pounds of compost is a big pile of wheelbarrow load. So think about spreading a wheelbarrow load across an acre. Now, of course, most homesteaders, permaculture, we don't have spreaders like that that can be set to that type of thing. And we don't need to. But the, the most powerful way that I've seen to use it is as an extract and not a tea. And this is where I guess Elaine's going to get mad at me or whatever. But there's a reason for this. So we take a year to make a compost with almost 500 beneficial microorganisms in it. Then we're going to take it, put it in a bucket, give it some stuff to eat, pump oxygen in it for one to two days and explode the population. Okay. And that'll work, but there's going to be certain organisms in there that love what we did to it. They're going to be the ones that explode. All right. And the ones that don't love it, even if they don't, suffer they're just going to kind of sit there and wait like you said about the fungus so now this incredible portfolio that we had we've heavily weighted it to a few good guys they're going to do good work for us 
But if we make an extract and immediately apply it, we just kind of knock the biology loose. So an extract is anybody can do it. I, you know, when you get into making compost tea, there's a couple ways to do it right and about a thousand ways to do it wrong. Yeah. An extract, you take a five gallon straight uh, paint strainer, throw it in a five gallon bucket, throw two handfuls of compost in it, fill the bucket most of the way up with water, stick your arm in there and mix it around for a couple minutes. I actually use air stones because I don't want to sit there and mix it. It won't hurt to use air stones. So I throw about four air stones in it on two pumps to turn it on, set a timer on my phone for 10 minutes, pull the strainer out, squeeze it out and go apply it. And the response to that, is unbelievable. Another way to, to really turbocharge it, though, is to make your own potting soil with it and then do all your starts with it. And then you're vertically inserting into your garden. And if you're doing things like adding charcoal, biochar to it, then you're also adding biochar into your growing beds every single year. And there's, there's a piece of this we haven't spoke of yet. And that is what we do after the thermophilic cycle is over. Well, then we're going to go get about a half a pound of worms for bioreactor and throw them in there. And then we've taken this static pile compost. We've also kind of turned it into a giant worm bin. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get so much reduction of, of the compost over time is because you actually have things in there feeding on this. And of course, the worms are now leaving worm castings and the worms move all kinds of bi biology through and produce all so sorts of biology as well. And usually we'll use a compost worm for that red wiggler. Well, inevitably, you have this beautiful pile. And one thing I do different than Dr. Johnson, again, is I don't use a pallet on the bottom. With the size I make them, you get plenty of airflow. I've been doing it five years. I've never had one go anaerobic ever. Not a single time. If you do, you use too much green. You, if you go in there and you put in like 50% grass clippings, that'll do it. I promise you every time. So inevitably, you're going to get earthworms as well migrating in from the bottom. And so you just end up with like, there is, there is nothing wrong with the type of compost your folks are making. I think they should keep making it. But there's no way you're going to get the biological diversity compared to something. In fact, the compost you make, if you threw it in a bioreactor and left it there for a year, exactly. it's probably going to mature much in the same way. But again, there's a lot of little hacks in there. I'm using aquatic plants. I'm using, uh, Matt Powers was here and he looked at it and he goes, I don't understand how you're getting compost that's not alkaline out of straw, you know? And then he came here and he looked at it. He goes, oh, you're patient. And I said, I don't know if I'm patient or if I'm lazy. But one way or the other, that's the difference. I, you know, I've, I've often said, you know, I'm a big fan for using the right dog to the hunt. Okay, so if I need compost quick, maybe I'll do the 18-day method. But I don't care what anybody says. Your fungal, I don't care if it's day 18, you did everything perfect. That same 18-day compost, I don't, I'm, I've shown people how to do this. You know, it's not, well, it does take a little bit of finesse but you still don't have any fungal dominance. They're still in the spore state if they're even in there yet. It, I, I think, Jack, what is so attractive to me from this process is that there's no, just like Joel always says, you can't Google experience. Well, you can't speed up. Well, you actually, Jeff Lawton shows that you can. We can stack in time, sure, sure. But sure, there's yeah. some things you can't. Right. right. But generally, if you take an 18, just because it's done in 18 days, doesn't mean I'm going to use it. I know that that fungal component is not there. I know that if I let that cure a while and there's other methods we use to, you know, get that off and running. But I know that if I let it cure a while, that is going to bring in the fungal compost because our compost, there's never a bacterial problem. Yeah. There's almost never a bacterial problem. It's the fungus that everybody's missing the boat on. And what makes your process even cooler, I think, is that, like you said, there is a distinction between an extract and a, um, a tea. And, a tea. and I kind of steer people away from a tea anyway because there's so much that can go wrong. Um, there's a big chance of it going anaerobic if you're not carefully monitoring it. And the tea should be used primarily more of a, as a foliar spray. But you're taking basically, I mean, good night, man. The, the ways in which you can multiply a cubic yard of what you're making 
is astonishing if you're doing extract out of it because even under Elaine's program, um, BioComplete Compost, you're basically taking one gallon per acre. And yeah. if what you got right there on a homestead level, not only is it, like you said, you, you may have to bust it for a little bit for a weekend, you stand back for a year, come back, you got stuff that you can't even dream to buy. And I'm guessing through your course, you're kind of walking them through it from start to finish, right? Correct. Correct. I, I tell you exactly how to do everything and then exactly how to use it. And I'm going to pull another thing up here on the screen real quick, if you don't mind. Sure. This is a little tool that I found while I was building this course. If you want. Yeah, there it is. It's called a jab planner, and that's the double sided one. These are really popular in Asia. I don't know if you've ever seen one before, but they have a, a seed disc on one side. And they will not do things like carrot or really fine seed. This would probably be like the smallest would be like a spinach seed or something or a daikon radish or something like that. And every time you push it, it goes into the soil and it opens like a beak and it drops a seed in. And if you're going to its limit on small, it might drop too. big deal. The other side is for fertilizer. So every time you're putting a seed in, you're, you're dropping fertilizer about two inches to its right or left, depending on which way you're holding it. And that means once that plant starts growing, roots are like, hello, boom, right there. Well, what you can do here then is you take that compost, you mix it maybe with, a, add some extra biochar to it. And it, even if you're not seeding, say mid-season, your tomatoes, your peppers, whatever, only fill the fertilizer side. And you can inject this compost plus anything else you want to, whether it's like I use crab shell and stuff like that as well. You can make a mix of that and inject that right into the soil. So you're putting it right down in the root zone and you can adjust that tool to anywhere from a half tablespoon to two tablespoons. It'll, it'll do whatever you want. You can also adjust the depth of it. Another way to use it, if you're sowing like a row of beans, just cut your furrow in and sprinkle the bottom with it and mm -hmm. drop your seeds on top of it and cover. If you're using a seeding tool, like if you're a market gardener and you're using like a roller seeder or something, what you want to do then is make a slurry out of that compost. And again, this is all on my course and slurry cover that seed and let it dry out so that it'll, it won't jam up in your cedar, then put it in your cedar. And the difference in biomass with seeds put down that way is, is, is incredible. Now, I haven't done it that way, but Dr. Johnson's done the research on that. And I'm, you know, what he says, based on my results following his procedures, I, I just take to be, you know, valid at this point. I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, the cool thing about what everybody's thinking, oh, I got to get compost. I got to get tons and tons of compost. I would rather have, honestly, a Ziploc bag full of the quality stuff that I know you're probably producing out of that than I would an entire pallet. Yes. Quite, and folks, I'm not overstating it. An entire pallet of the best bagged stuff you can find out there. And then when you're doing methods like Jack's talking about, it's such a giant combat multiplier because you can take a Ziploc bag. Well, let me, let's say a five gallon bucket. And you could probably cover your entire farm with it if it's power packed like this stuff is. So, um, man, I got, I got to know. Um, so somebody out there, there's obviously a number of people out there that are going to find this um, something attractive. And folks, I highly recommend it. You're going to wish you did. You're going to wish you wanted, you got this course because in these times right now, you cannot trust the stuff in the bag at the store. You can. The videos. And I'm so Let's talk about some of the problems with commercial compost. I think Paul Wheaton has convinced the entire world that all compost has uh, persistent herbicide in it if you get it commercially. I find that to be, I, I, when anybody says all or every or whatever, I, I really kind of discard that opinion. Right there with you. You can't know that, right? And I think there's an awful lot of compost out there that people go by and they put it down and they have problems like retarded growth and stuff like this or they have, you know, a chlorosis in their leaves and like, but I put compost on it. And I think there's, there, there's two things that work here. Number one, a lot of these operations, and I don't think they're doing it intentionally, but they're just making as much as they can, as fast as they can, because they're trying to make money. And I understand that. Well, high turn, and they're probably using tons of like CAFO manure and dairy manure. Well, I've talked about the salt already. 
Those are the two highest salt manures on the planet. And dry, dry dairy manure is about 5% salts. Wow. Five Because of what they're fed to keep them producing and all. It's a very high sodium diet that they're on. So when you're making that, you're making a salty compost. So you wouldn't put salt out on your garden and say, why didn't it grow? You'd be like, I shouldn't have done that. So I think some of it's a salt issue. The other thing is I think a lot of it's just not done. So a lot of, a lot of people have gotten all in a wad about actinobacteria. And actinobacteria, a lot of times you get some commercial compost, you have this white powdery shit in it, and you're like, oh, well, that's that's fungus, and it's not. Um, but what it, I guarantee it is when you see it in commercial compost, there's two real clades, I guess you'd say, of actinobacteria. There's thermophilic and non-thermophilic. And what you're looking at is thermophilic and actinobacteria. If that's still in your compost, it's not done. It's actinobacteria are very important to the composting process. They're one of the main things that break down lignin. If you go back to before they existed, like before they evolved in the long timetable of the earth, a lot of material that fell on the ground laid there forever. It didn't break down. There was nothing to break down lignin until that type of bacteria and certain fungi evolved on the planet. So the actinobacteria itself is not a problem, but seeing that particular type in a commercial product in a bag that can't finish in a bag means that that was unfinished. And it's inevitable. And no way. a giant corporation that's owned by a publicly traded company that has to watch a stock price, if they can get it out the door one day faster, they're going to do it. And it's not that they're evil. We're not talking about Monsanto here, for God's sakes. We're just saying that they don't really know how to do what they're trying to do. Um, the question we have here from Coasty, is my course able to guide someone who's never composted before from start to finish? Yes. Yes, it is. It's just, you're going to wait a year for the compost. I'm going to teach you how to make there. There is no, no one that can't do it after completing the course, unless you just didn't want to, if you can make a ring and put stuff inside it and keep it wet and fall, if you can bake a cake by the directions on the back of the box, you'll be able to make my compost, but you'll also be able to explain why the cake worked. That's 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 the big thing that I'll give you because anybody can do it. But if you don't know why it worked, inevitably as humans, we take shortcuts. That's fine if you know what, what you're shortcutting. If you don't understand the reason it was done a certain way in the first place and you make a change without knowing it, and I've made changes to see like what will inevitably happen with me. You know, Texas you used to live here. There's fire ants everywhere. We got fire ants living in the sky here. You're right. And I'm like living up in a tree. Um, so inevitably, cool, wet, soft, fire ants will invade. So every time I take worms out of my farm and put them in there, you know, out of my worm composter and stick them in there, they get killed. And the fire ants invade. And, and you know, I can only do so much about them until it's time to start using the compost because I don't want to do anything to harm the compost. Um, so I stopped doing worms one time. I said, I'm not going to put worms in this one. It was good compost, but the stuff that you saw a couple of years ago in Tennessee that, that I gave you a ball of it, it was like yeah. clay. It was like clay, but it crumbled, which doesn't make any sense, but that's how it works. Um, it didn't quite get that heavy clay, like consistency and feeling because it lacked the activity of the worms. So now I'm just like, okay, worms, I'm sorry, you're going to get murdered, but you have to do your job until you do. So, like, I've made all these mistakes, if they're mistakes. I've made all these tests. And, and like I said, I'm not a big microscope guy. I believe in the science. It's not that I don't believe. But I also know that if I make it two different ways, that I can then apply it to two identical plots, and I can compare the results. And I know what works better because most people are not going to become microbiologists. They just want to grow really healthy, nutritious food. That's Permaculture, I can use it to design a city. I can use it to design a business. But most people come to the dance to grow food. So that's what we focus on at Home Food Systems. That's I think that, I think you're knocking it out of the park with this. And as far as the value, folks, for the information that he dropped in that first episode alone, I, look, I don't get anything out of telling you this. I'm just, I honestly feel like in this day and age, it's my duty to put out the best information I possibly can when it comes, because times are getting real, things are getting crazy. Um, I, I literally, you folks heard me talk about what happened at the farm store down the road from me 
as soon as Ukraine kicked off and all of a sudden they can't get their, the fertilizer costs went three times higher. Well, just like Jack said in the beginning, you can get yourself out of the NPK salt cycle, which is what I call it. Yeah. Just by knowing how to do this process, it's as lazifarian as it gets. And I guarantee the results are going to knock your socks off. So Jack, if, if anybody's considering doing this, how do they, how do they, um, how do they get a hold of this course? And um, real you know, simple. What's, what's next as far as your online courses? Sure. It's at homefoodsystems.com. Homefoodsystems, all one word.com. My main site is the survivalpodcast.com. I set this up as a thing apart. There's a plenty of people that want to learn how to make compost that don't care about prepping or all the other stuff we teach. So I wanted it that way. And I, it, it allows me more effective marketing of just that thing as a business unit. So we, we set it apart that way. It's built on a platform called Learn Dash. It's really simple. You have to register. Then you can you know buy a course because it's built on WordPress. So you have to be a user to be able to you know take the course. And uh, you, you you watch the videos and then you take the exams. And at the end of it, you get a certification uh, by me that you have completed the course fully. I don't know what it's really worth. I know that I underpriced it because that's how I do business. Uh, I'm a believer that the secreting of knowledge is a sin, especially in the world that we're in. And I'm not a religious person, but I use the words that make sense for what I'm talking about. We have people that need to learn how to do these things. And it, 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 my look at it is if you won't give 40 bucks for it, you don't really want it. And, and I, I believe I've said on, on my show, I think if I priced that at a hundred bucks, no, I would have probably sold just as many and no one would complain, but I'm not looking to try to make fortune off of it. And what I'm trying to do is build a portfolio of courses and what I'm building for, and I'm not really promoting the show, but I will say it is I'm building for something that myself and, and, and Nick Ferguson have talked about for years and that there needs to be something along the lines of what we're calling, because I don't have a better word for it right now, a PPDC a practical permaculture design course. So I've taken several permaculture design courses. I've taught in, in quite a few of them. I've never done one on my own all the way through. I've always been part of the team doing it because it's it's an inhuman course to teach, honestly. Bill Mollison said that 80 hours in two weeks of instruction will burn you right out. So I encourage my fellow instructors to team up with other people for PVCs because you'll just live a better life if you do. Uh, next is coming. I, I just did the last lesson for it today. My admin guy, Tom, who takes care of all the back end of everything. Guy I trust so much. He could he could shut down my whole kingdom tomorrow and there'd be nothing I could do about it, really. Um, so that's how my trust is. And, and he's assembling that. And that is based on uh, Mollison's Three Ethics and Prime Directive and Holgram's 12 Principles. So it's more of a philosophical design course. That's going to be free. App, and I, that's another course I probably could charge 50 bucks where nobody would have complained about. But I wanted people to be able to come to my site, register and take a class and know who they're getting as an instructor and understand my methodology, my tone, my conversations. Because I've taken courses from people that they're not they, they were information rich, but I just didn't vibe with them. So you might not vibe with me. And if you don't vibe with me, then you should know that before you give me your money. So I'm kind of, that's going to be like the, the one of the required courses. So I'm building a whole pathway through this that by the time I get it completely populated and I'm churning them out at about a course a month, um, you will be able to pick and choose to get like a larger certificate if you want to. But if you just want to learn how to make biochar, there'll be a course for that. So my first three paid course will be, I already got the compost course. Uh, I've got all the material done. I'm, as soon as I'm done with the free one, I'm going to start doing the recording on one on cover cropping and cover cropping built for the homesteader, the prepper, the, the backyard permaculture, the market gardener, not the person with 40 or 400 or 4,000 acres. I'm drawing from people like Ray Aculeta, who, by the way, if you want to know about soil, Ray Aculeta is doing God's freaking work, man. That dude, how he became what he did inside NRCS, I don't even know. But God bless that dude. Um, I've learned so much from him and I'm incorporating and I'm taking that there. I got to give I got to tell your peeps this about something I saw him present recently that blew my mind. It was under night vision, but not the green stuff. I don't know what they were using and it made it hard to see, but it was a cornfield with all the stover left behind after the, the corn was harvested and the big giant brown leaves of corn are moving and then they're turning just a little bit and tucking down. 
And then when you look harder, these giant earthworms, they're grabbing the leaf, they're pulling it a little bit into their burrow, and they're twisting it, and then they're going down the hole. And then they come back later. What they're doing, they're putting the leaf in contact with the soil organisms because they don't want to eat the leaf. They want to eat the microbes that break down the leaf. So they're gardening. So a Mollisonian principle is what? Everything gardens, right? That's one of Bill Mollison's principles. Everything gardens. The worms are gardening. They're growing their own bacteria and fungi to feed on if we take care of the soil. So I'm trying to teach people how to get that going on in a garden versus, you know, like a, a, a no-till uh, farm. Because we have a lot more people that are trying to grow food on a quarter acre than, than a quarter plot. Right. I mean, we just do. And we have so many people clamoring for this information. So that's that's kind of the path forward. I think it's a great idea and I think it's needed. And um, I think the price is way lower than, you know, I mean, that's typical for you, though. I mean, you do deliver a lot for what people pay. And uh, folks, you can't get more. You can't get a better bang for your buck. I guarantee you. As I said, if you were late coming into this dead, dead serious. He provided maybe the first 10 hours in a course that I spent a lot of, a lot of, a lot of money for. Jack, I want to get into something else. Um, thanks, everybody that's coming in. If you would, hit that thumbs up if you're just getting in here. Um, yeah, Ray is awesome, and he gives some great workshops. Man, you sent me this video a while back. I think it was on TikTok or something like that, and I thought it was a brilliant idea. And you're basically getting – you're getting primal cuts and you're yep. doing some pretty awesome stuff with it. So um, if you don't mind, I mean, is there anything else you want to say before we get into the butchery thing? No, no. We'll talk about some meat cutting. It's just guys, if you've been listening to this and you, you, you want to take the course again, homefoodsystems.com. And if you want to know more about me, the survival podcast and some of the things we're going to talk about now, I did a couple episodes on it and I'll make sure we get those links to Billy so he can post them or whatever after the fact. But I want to, I'm going to show this video here. I think that yeah, it I think it's great for itself. Um, this is, this is from what's called the chuck roll, which is kind of the underblade piece. This is where, if you're familiar with the chuck eye, it comes from, uh, those are Denver stakes. Well, let's just go ahead and play it. You probably want to, right, your... want to see what I'm up to today. Um, I picked up a bunch of meat from a Costco business center recently. This is one piece of meat. I think of. this is what's, uh, the, the end result of a chuck roll. One of my favorite things about chuck rolls is getting chuck eyes and Denver steaks. Uh, this one wasn't really that great for getting chuck eye, though. I looked at the chuck eye, and it just didn't seem like it was going to make really nice chuck eye steaks. So what I decided to do is basically make a stand-in for a boneless prime rib roast with it. And so that'll keep it shape, and this will just be beautiful. And this will eat exactly like you're eating a piece of, of, of prime rib. Because if you think about a cow... Your first ribeye's here, and then this goes up to the head. So this is the same muscle. It's just up over the shoulder. It's commonly called the uh, poor man's ribeye, also known as the Delmonico steak. Again, I just decided to go with a roast for it. These are Denver steaks. When you look at a chuck eye or a chuck roast, if you get a good piece from this end, you'll look in and you'll see the chuck eye, and then the other side, you see this beautiful marbling. These are the Denver steaks. So we've got six Denver steaks. And then anything that looked like it would work really good for this. I just wanted some of this. I want to like, you know, either use it as carne asada or pepper steak. And there's a ton there. There's at least, I know for a lot of families, that's probably four meals for four people. For me and Dorothy, that's probably two meals for two people. We're very meat centric in our diet. Uh, then over here, we had some of these other pieces that were kind of off the Denver steak area that I just decided would make really nice, uh, basically uh, fake short ribs, if you want to call them that. So I'll treat these exactly like, a beef short rib, we'll do a little braise and a little Chianti wine or something like that. That'll be fantastic. Over here was all of the really nice meat that would cube nicely for stew. So again, that's probably two, two pots of stew uh, for a normal family and probably one big pot of stew for us. And then a huge amount that's gonna go to ground. And this didn't have to be this way, but I want some really great ground. And to me, Chuck is some of the greatest grounds you'll get. And I do have some uh, fat trim out in the freezer that I could mix in. I'm going to be doing some other cuts today before I grind. I'm going to do one grind. I'm not going to do multiple grinds. So I might 
end up adding a little bit of fat, but I doubt it. This is kind of a perfect 80-20 mix as it is. And so when, the one you talk about doing this, people always say, well, what about the waste? Here's the waste. Out of this entire thing, this is the stuff. And if I was nitpicky, I could get in there and pull some more red meat off it and all. But uh, basically, the stuff you want to get rid of is your silver skin, anything that's kind of snotty instead of hard and fat, anything that looks like this. You, you don't want to eat this. If you, if you, people say this won't render. If this co is cooked long enough, it will render. But uh, in most instances, it won't. There's probably some stuff in here I could get out and use. But waste, Charlie? Do you see any waste? I don't see any waste, buddy. Do you see any waste? No, there's no waste. What about Bell? Does Bell see any waste? Is there any waste there, Bell? No, there's no waste. Yeah, they won't get all of this in one go. All right, that's enough. I just go. I paid eighty bucks for all that meat. That, bro, I don't even know. What, I'm sorry? $80 for all that meat. I don't even know where to start because I've been, look, man, I've been a butcher in this trade for a long time. And I know guys that have been in the trade that don't do a job anywhere close to that good. But what is absolutely astonishing is that in today's prices, you were able to produce that for 80 bucks. I mean, if you were to break those down and you were to buy those as regular retail cuts, bro, that I, I don't even know what you would pay for that. Do you have any idea? Right. Um, I figured out in that one, I think that it was about 230, $230. And I, I had to, some of the stuff that you can do for yourself and we can talk about that is stuff you won't be able to buy. Like a, I've never seen a Denver steak for sale at a supermarket in my life. Some of the custom shops are doing it now. Some of the online higher end are doing it. And I don't get why, because it's really not a hard thing to do if you're at all skilled as a, as a meat cutter. I mean, at all. Like if you can, if you can do anything beyond bust steaks off of a, of a strip loin, you can, you can get a Denver steak out. One of the hacks I give people when they put Chuck's, Chuck uh, roast on sale, at the grocery store, once you know what a chuck eye looks like, yeah. there's usually from every chuck that they bust into like multiple roasts, there's an end that's usually about four inches thick, and there's an eye sitting right there. Yeah. All you literally have to do is just there'd be two muscles with a fat separator. You grab it and you can without a knife, you can pull it apart. You've got a chuck eye on one side of your hand, right? So then you bust that thing vertically down. You got two chuck eye stakes. That other piece, that's the Denver steak. And all you got to do is part that to the size and, you know, pay attention to the way the, 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 the grain flows. But those are two of the best eating steaks in the world. There's a restaurant in New York called Delmonico's. The Delmonico is the Chuck Eye. In fact, the Del Delmonico is so in demand that people literally now in restaurants are serving ribeyes and calling them Delmonico's. Yep. So the yep. poor man ribeye is now being lied about as the Delmonico so that you can sell a ribeye as a Delmonico. A, they taste better because it's that more working muscle. They have more flavor, but they're still very tender. And there's a lot of tender in that, that chuck roll. The chuck roll is one of the best banks for the buck. Well, how did you, how did you learn this? Because I've, I've, it's one thing for me to process an animal. It's on all fours. I break it down. You know, I'm, trained at a typical butcher shop, but even I didn't even know what, I mean, I would have done that a different way because it's, I'd never thought about breaking it. Usually when you get it to a chuck, you're never going to have a butcher break it down any further. Ever. No. No. Ever. It's never going to happen. So when I saw what you did there and I was like, oh my goodness, that was fantastic, bro. Where did you even learn that? Well, I mean, look, look we can lose that now if you want to, too. Um, I, I, First, I learned how to cut meat in general as a kid because my family lived on deer meat. I mean, like we, my little sister, when she was 12, went to hunter safety and got a license. I don't want to hunt yet, but you, you go and get a license because there's a deer tag on it, right? Like, mm -hmm. so I learned how to process meat that way, but I didn't learn this level. And I wouldn't do this with a deer because the cuts are too small. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, the USDA and the Beef Cutters Association and a bunch of other people spent like a billion dollars to find missed opportunities on the cow. And I read this report about this, and there were certain things that they found. 
And the Chuck Eye was well known, but like the Denver steak wasn't. There's another piece, and basically the piece that the the, the Denver comes from, if you can make them all Denvers, or there's a place if you follow that muscle all the way to the neck where the grain's going this way and then it changes and goes that way. If you cut it right there and leave that other piece whole like a strip, like a flank steak, they call that a Sierra. And that's going to cook a lot like a flank. So I just read this report. And once I knew what I was looking for, if I couldn't figure it out, I just went on YouTube and like, where do you get the Denver steak from? Then as I'm doing all this, I found this dude on TikTok named Meat Dad. And the dude sounds like Danny DeVito. He was a butcher for like 20 years. There's even some of this stuff because I've asked him in comments, like, what about Sierra? He doesn't know, but he knows a lot. And so that kind of turned me on to this. And then I started saying, well, what other pieces of that we can get as primals and subprimals are there and what comes out of them? So then I was like, in in this report that I read, you know, what's this is a fairly well-known cut now. It's, it's called a flat iron steak. Well, that flat iron steak's another thing that comes from the shoulder. It comes from the other lower part of the shoulder, the arm. And what you would if you buy that primal, you're looking for a chuck clod. And so I just watched how to do it, but then I had some basic knowledge of how to process meat in the first place. And what it always really comes down to is the separation of muscles. And part of this skill and what makes it such a valuable thing to learn is I processed that chuck roll that way. There were other ways to do it. Mm -hmm. I did what I wanted for the time. And like I made that decision on the chuck eye to make it a roast because it just sometimes you'll get one. And when you look at it, it just and there's a solution to that, though. You could do what I did and tie it and then in between your strings and it'll hold it together and cook. But I, when I saw it, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to leave it that way. But, yeah, I learned it mostly from family on the basics and then doing these kind of upper end things. And this is we were talking about this a couple of years ago when we were in Tennessee together and. You're talking about how people want to jump right to, you know, they're, they're calling it butchery, but they're really talking about a charcuterie. Absolutely. And you're trying to teach them to take the whole animal. And what I, this is what I was talking about when I said there is a place to teach people how to take these primals because there's other ways to do this. You know, there's other ways to leverage that. I think I think it was a, as many times as I've cut a roast out of there. I swear I was I was kicking myself because I was like, I can't even believe I never thought of doing this. I don't even know how many of those I've cut. Yeah. I even begin to count. And I was like, okay, from even if you were to, I mean, you you couldn't, I don't know how you could do this on a personal level, but you spent 80 bucks for that. And then retail, if you were to break it down, especially, you know, if you bought that off the rack, you, one of the little butcher's trick we do is, or that you can do is if you buy a steak, just put it on a rack in your fridge, let it sit for about a week. Mm hmm draw out more moisture you're going to let the enzymes do their bit but i mean it's little tricks like that and then when i saw this from you and i'm like i watched that again and i'm like man i feel like a complete dunce because the it's obvious is all get out when you're looking at it you lay the chuck on the side yeah you're like okay what could i do with this and i'm like why on earth i i, I don't know man it just floored me when i saw it but, you know, as far as translating to other folks out there, how could they replicate this or some of the other methods? Where would they go to find the primals in your area or any other place? Well, a lot of the grocery stores and all, if you're, you know, you're not buying grass fed meat, obviously, in this situation. But many people, that's that's where they're at anyway. You know, you can only afford to buy what you can afford to buy. And if you go to the grocery store and they like have chuck on sale or whatever, usually they're not getting that meat in pre-cut. They're getting in, you know, there's like, there's like numbers like a 114A yep. or whatever that they're ordering. And they usually have it in the back. And if you go and just ask, you know, the dude back in the meat section, can you send me a whole chuck roll or a chuck clot or a whole uh, top sirloin round or whatever, a top sirloin butt? They'll, is once you know the words, to ask, most of the time they'll go back and get one and they'll knock it down because they're not doing the work. They're charging you for every single thing that they do along the way. Yep. The best bang for the buck in finding these, though, unfortunately, there's only 12 of them in the country. And it's a Costco business center. And it is definitely mainstream meat, but it is a quality level. It's restaurant quality. And it costs less than the grocery. It costs less than the regular Costco. Um 
but they're like in San Francisco. There's one in Dallas, and there's like one in New Jersey. I don't know where they all are. You'll have to look it up. If you have one near you, you want to go just because it'll be a fun experience. Take a coat and gloves because the um, the the walk-in cooler is – I don't know how big it is, but my shop's 1,800 square foot, and it's bigger than my shop. And it's just meat everywhere. And they have, you know, top sirloin butt. They have full – bone in uh, pork racks all of all of the primals and sub primals across everything that you could ever look for but i'm going to really tell people like a great place to start is that chuck roll because there's so much you can do with it and it's a little complicated and so it's just complicated enough to build your confidence that you can do this because yeah you can go buy it and, and the other video i had there that's a strip loin so that's new york strip and that was also like 81 dollars and I got 12 New York strips for $81. And when I cut one for myself, they're like an inch and a quarter. I yeah. cut them for like three quarter for my wife, an inch and a quarter for me. I can cook them the same length of time. And hers is well done, which I consider ruined. And mine is medium. And we eat together. So that's my that's how I solved that problem. But I got two quarts, or not two quarts, two pints of tallow off that strip loin as well. So you, oh, know, wow. you can still use every piece of the, huh. the part all the way because your strip one is going to have that big fat cap that you can take right. over there. So Costco Business Center is your number one. If you have like a restaurant supply store near you, like Restaurant Depot or whatever, those work too. And a lot of people think, well, you can't go because you're not a restaurant. All you have to do is be a company. So a lot of your peeps probably have little side businesses from their farm and all. If you're incorporated, you can go right on down to Restaurant Depot or these other type of restaurant outlets and get a membership with them. If you have a Costco business center, you don't need anything special. Your regular Costco card will work for them. Sam's Club will do this as well. If you do have a Costco business center near you, the problem is you can't really see what they have online unless they think you're ordering it for delivery and get pricing. So if you stick your zip code in, you may be too far away for their delivery and it'll say it's not available. Just look their address up at the store, stick their zip code in, and all of a sudden everything will appear and there's more than you will see there. But, like, you can buy a whole freaking lamb, Billy, at Costco Business Center. Yeah. Like, yeah. the whole lamb, end to end. And then you can look, if you can break down a lamb, you can break down a deer. Right? So you can start to translate it that way. I mean, and the other thing is, I really think that Jeff Jeff Lawton talked years ago about making a book and getting it collaborated on. It just never happened. It was like 1,000 things every child should know by the time they're 18. And I think something that should go in there is how to break down a chicken. We spend $20,000 a year on pupils in some states. We pay like $15,000 a year on a pupil in Texas for 13 years, and a kid can't break a chicken down. <laughs> I know that sounds nitpicky, but like that's a life skill, and there's so much you can do with that. Like, So chicken is another thing that I think that people should learn how to do. And if you, I'm going to raise, I'm going to raise chickens. Ever heard this one? I'm going to raise chickens for meat and eggs, Billy. And then I'm going to process them myself. Go buy a chicken and learn to process the bird after it's plucked. Because you're going to have to do that anyway. Exactly. And, and there's a dude, his, it's like Nat Chez or something. He's an Egyptian or some kind of Arabic uh, guy that's on uh, TikTok as well. The way that dude breaks, he's a savant, man. I mean, that dude breaks down a chicken and it's just like, and it's like in eight pieces. And it's that fast. It's crazy how he does it. But I don't care how you do it. Learn how to do these things. You know, I do things like with chicken. I always, if I'm going to cook thigh, if I'm not cooking it whole, I'll skin it, bone it, cook the cutlet, save the bones for stock. And I'll store up the skin till it's worth doing. And I'll render all that skin down. Now you got crispy skin and you got schmaltz. And that chicken fat is fantastic for cooking. You cook a steak and chicken fat, you get a sear on it like you can't believe. And so <laughs> by taking this very simplistic skill, and somebody was asking if I have a recommended blade, like this is this is 90% of what I use. Is that Victor Knox? This is a Victor Knox, and this is a semi-stiff boning knife, six inch, and this is an eight-inch breaking knife. And if you were breaking down whole animals, I'd tell you to get a 10 or 12-inch breaking knife. If you're breaking down primals and subprimals, that's all you need. These are about 30 bucks a piece. And get yourself a decent sharpening steel and learn how to daggone use it. You won't have to put these on a stone very often. They're a thin 
profile blade. So if you don't let them go dull, you won't have to sit down with a stone to get an edge back on them. Basically, a sharpening steel is really a honing steel. It keeps an you know this, but it keeps an edge. And I have a grinder and a, and a chamber vacuum sealer. And, and those are nice to have, but you don't need them to get started. And you can use any knife. Just this knife right here. I bet you can attest to this. Like, this is probably the most used knife by meat cutters in shops across the country, probably across oh, yeah. the world. When, when, I, when I put these out on, on, on my website for people to, to get off Amazon, a guy said he went to, like, school to learn how to cut meat in 2001, and this was one of the things they gave him when, the first day of that school was this particular knife. And this will do anything. This will this will take care of your chicken. I can even do things that I do with the breaking knife with that smaller knife. But just when you're you're cutting steaks out of like a strip loin and it's a big strip loin, that long sh uh, uh, blade just does a better job of getting a nice straight cut. You know, it's when I first got in the butcher's trade right off the bat, this guy, you know, the guys I learned from were like, basically Michelin star quality guys that decided they're going to be butchers. Okay. And right off the bat, they're like, okay, I'm, I'm like, what do I need? I'm as green as got as green as green could be. Yes. They're like, dude, don't spend money on this. This just get Victorinox, get a six inch, get a 10 inch, get a 12 inch because you need a 12. When you're going to start messing with cows, you kind of no. need, you need it. You need a 12. Um, 10 is more than enough for even the biggest pig. And in fact, I mean, anybody's ever seen any of my videos, I did an entire pig with a Leatherman. So you can use pretty much <laughs> anything if it comes down to it. I mean, yeah, that was a long, long video. But the point of it being is that, folks, it doesn't have to be all that complicated. And Jack pointed out something that I think is absolutely fantastic, folks. I've showed you before the strong bond method of breaking down a chicken where it's a whole chicken. Like Jack said, go buy the whole chicken. You're going to save a pile of money anyway. Break it down. It is not difficult. You slit it each side, make a little saddle for it, cut off the breast, cut off the fryers, cut off the wings, got yourself stocked. That's start with just a regular chicken. I don't know how many chicken classes I've taught, but I've always encouraged people to, hey, once you leave here, I've showed you all this stuff. Go buy whole chickens if you don't have any ready yet. Practice on those guys. And, you know, if it, like we always say in the butcher's trade, small cuts, small mistakes. You're not mm -hmm. going to run through it as quickly as me or Jack right out of the bat, but nobody does. So go out there, start with a little thing, start with a chicken. And then I'll tell you another thing, Jack, if people are, a lot of people that look at, like my butcher's course online, they, I think I got, I got a pig butchery and I haven't yet done lamb or any of the other stuff yet. But the point being is... If you wanted, folks, if you don't want to go ahead and go through the look to get that pig all the way through, you're going to have to take its life. You're going to have to either skin it, which I prefer, or you can scald it. Either one, it doesn't matter. But what you could do based on what Jack said there, why couldn't you bring that animal in and say, look, just give me the sides back and then I'm going to go step by step through Billy's yeah. video or yeah. break it down into primals and I'll do it from there. Jack showed me how to do it from primals. You know what I mean? I mean, bro, there's yep. 10,000 different ways to do this where you can get yourself trained and save a pile of money all at the same time. I The last half beef I did, I went into my guy, and he is an honest butcher. He really is. I usually end up with more because I split a, a, a cow with another guy, so I get a half. And that guy doesn't want the extra bones, and he doesn't want organ meat. And also, I'm like, I'll take it all. Um, but I had him give me the chuck roll and the clod and the whole sirloin. And I let him process everything else. There you and go. He said, Why do you want to do that? I said, are you going to take the mouse out of the sirloin for me? And he said, what's the mouse? And I said, that's why. Right. And I said, don't freeze it, hang it. And th they get nervous about that because they want to get it the hell out the way so they can get yep. another uh, customer in because you know how backed up it is now. And I'm like, you call me. The day you call me, I will come pick my stuff up. So I went out and everything else that he processed for me is all in boxes frozen. And those pieces, and I threw them in my cooler and brought them home and processed them. And I don't know about you, I like doing it. I love I find it. it very peaceful. It's kind of zen. You're in the zone and you get things the way you want them. And there's, you know, I also want to tell you, there's some cuts that you can't get. Yep. So that toll top sirloin kind of on the bottom in between the two separations, there's this little piece of meat they call the mouse. 
And everybody I've ever seen, except the bearded butchers, who somebody mentioned in your chat here, takes that thing and throws it in for grind. That is one of the best steaks on a cow. Exactly. It's not big. It's like nine, 10 ounces usually. It's a lunch steak. You know who it's for? It's for the guy that does the knife work. You, you process that meat, you put all the meat away, and you take that piece out and you cook it for yourself. And it is just delicious. And there's things, like I said, like a flat iron. At least you can get those now. There's another one, and I don't know where the hell they're going. And you used to get them when you bought a, a, a clod, again, which is the lower arm piece of the chuck. And it's called a Terrace Major. Yep. And if you and the know terrace what it looks major. like, just put Terrace Major in Google, and you'll see it on a human. And it looks like a tenderloin, but a small tenderloin. It looks about the size of like a tenderloin from a big deer when it's off a cow. Right. And it is a fantastic steak. And it used to be you could only get them by buying that clod and getting them out yourself. Now they sell them by the case, but I don't know who buys them because I've never seen them anywhere. You know, we when we were in the butcher shop I was at, we had, of course, there's a Terrace Major, Terrace Minor. There's a spider steak. There's so many different steaks on that animal. And you're never, ever, even in the higher end butcher shops, it's even hard to move some of that meat there. Um, but that's where you're going to find it. If you're going to find it, we're talking like really, really high end stuff, mm -hmm. but look, Jack, you, you're hitting on something. That's really, you're getting better quality stuff and cuts that you could never dream to ever find any other place just by having that skill and doing it yourself. There are so many different ways. It's like when you break this thing down, it's like, okay. If I'm going to get baby, there's a zero sum game to all this stuff, <coughs> like on a pig or whatever the case may be. So if I want baby back ribs, well, you're not going to be getting your bone in pork chops. There you so go. You know, there's, you're going to win in one area, but you're going to, and it works the same exact way on a cow. But man, I got to say, I, you got me, you got my brain going at a hundred miles an hour when I saw you break that down and I'm like, doggone it. I've heard of a Denver steak. I didn't even know where it was. And yeah. I'm looking at the way you broke this thing down and I'm like, okay, if I think you view it the same way I do. When I cut meat, man, it is like the most therapeutic, laid back, chill thing I can do. I'm being creative and there's nothing. I don't think there's anything that chills me out more. I really no. don't think so. I almost feel like I'm like, people are probably like, that guy's kind of creepy if he likes to cut meat. I didn't say I like to kill things, so I like to cut the meat and process the meat. But like, you know, I'll do a deer out in my shop and it, it it's a very pleasant experience. And, you know, it, to me, it's very pleasant here because it's not so daggone cold. In Pennsylvania, I was a kid doing it. My hands were always frozen while I was out in the, the shanty cutting up deer. And, and here, you know, it's nice and temperate and I'm all happy and it's just cool enough. And I would tell you, like, again, these two knives and like Billy said, if you want to go up to a 10 inch, you certainly can, depending on what you're going to be working with. Um a grinder is totally worth investing and in. you can yes. get like a hand crank grinder for 20 bucks. If you want to, I use a grinder from a company called turbo force. They're about 160 bucks and they pretty much embarrass anything that's $300 or less. They're, they're just for the money. Fantastic. If you want to spend more money on a grinder, Cabela's carnivores are difficult to beat. Like one of my buddies had a one horsepower carnivore and we put like, I think we put like 80 pounds of, of, of deer trim through it. And it was like, I mean, I couldn't keep up with it. So it, you can spend as much as you want, but a $160 grinder, if you're buying cuts like that, it's going to pay for itself. What's ground. And then once you have that, you were talking about how people, you know, like you're not going to mess it up that bad small cuts. Let's say you bought that Chuck piece that I had for $80 and you screwed it up. You screwed it up so bad, you just got frustrated, cubed it up, and threw it in a grinder. You will not do that bad. But if you did, you still can't buy that quality of ground meat for $3.97 a pound. Absolutely. Which is what I paid for that. You can't do it. It doesn't exist. You can buy the tubed, nasty, pink slime garbage, maybe on sale for even 2 bucks. but you're not going to buy good, real Chuck 80-20 that's going to taste like that. So the worst thing that happens is you grind it. There's other stuff you can work with that's super simple to start with. A whole eye of round. Don't cut the dead gone fat. Don't tell me how yes. lean it is and cut the fat off it. Stop doing that. Yeah. But knock your ends off so you square it up, and those can be 
thin sliced and used for stir fry or something. But roasts out of those, if you don't overcook them, are delicious. Yeah. Cook it to 125 degrees and turn the or 120 degrees and turn the damn oven off and don't don't open the door unless it catches on fire. Leave it in there and let it let it rest at 120 in the oven. It'll come out. It'll be pink all the way through. And then another thing worth investing in, if if you're willing to do it, is a, is a slicer, a meat slicer. You know, I take I around that I pay 350 a pound for, and I make roast beef that's better than the crap they're selling for 15, 16 dollars a pound at the deli. And it's that, I mean, that's the whole formula. I don't even, I don't care what it weighs. I don't care anything. I stick a thermometer in it. I throw it in the oven. It hits 120 degrees. I shut the oven off and I walk away and I come back when it's cool. I throw it in a vacuum seal bag and vacuum seal, let it sit in the refrigerator for a couple of days after it's cooked. It kind of like lets all the seasoning even out. And, you know, it's ice cold when you put it on the slicer. So it slices beautiful. And man, every time we do like a family get together or whatever, and I put out that roast beef, it goes before anything else. And, and then people tell you I around is a, is a trash cut. Well, no, you're a trash cook. There you go. You're a trash it, cook. You don't know how to cook. There's so many awesome. I mean, there's so many obscure cuts on an animal that if you were to go to a place like Argentina, they know what a spider steak is. They know what a terrace major is. They know what a terrace minor is. You got me on the spider steak. I don't know what a spider steak is. Yeah, I'd have to show it. I'd have to show it to you. It's weird. It's like on the end of the hip. Okay. And there's only two on every cow. So it's. Yeah. But there's so many awesome, obscure cuts that in some of these meat cultures like Argentina, man, it's like it's second nature to these folks. And it's so awesome to see you do what you did there and make it translatable to a lot of other folks out there. Because honestly, with the way the way the cost is getting of everything right now, it is going to be in everyone's best interest. If you have to buy chicken, do not buy the parts and pieces. Why no. do you can buy the whole no. dog? On if you can't, if you can afford, go buy a, like Jack was saying a little bit ago, where you can buy the primal. For a cow, it's going to be a different. For a pig, it's going to be different. For a sheep, obviously, yeah. it's going to be different. Yeah. But you are going, we're going to need to be saving money for a lot of folks out there that are living, you know, it's all they can do to put bread on the table right now. If it means you, me eating meat and not eating meat is me know how to, knowing how to cut it. Well, I don't see much choice right there, bro, because I know you're a carnivore too. But, Jack, I got a great idea. Okay. Next time we wind up in the same place, I like the killing because it's so fulfilling. And then maybe <laughs> you, can take your, you can take whatever I kill and do something very special with it. Okay. We can do that. There's no yeah. reason we can't do that. Yeah. And I'll give you people some other things. That, again, you know, you're going commercial product here, but – Probably one of the best values that exists in meat that you can get at any Costco, not just the business center, is the, the the whole pork loins. That it's the rib loin and the strip loin all in one piece, and so you got a sirloin end on one end, and you got like the rib eye end on the other end. Just busting that into pork chops is money in the bank, and it and I cook those sous vide. That's another little piece of equipment oh, you yeah. might want to add, but. I take those and I make a sage salt. So I basically take by volume the same amount of salt and sage, and the sage is obviously going to get dissolved out. And I mix that together and I let the salt dry the sage out. And I rub those with that sage salt and then I sous vide them. And when I'm doing big workshops, instead of going down to pork chop size, I'll leave them as roast and I'll sous vide the whole roast. And then my cook, all he does is bust them into like one inch chops mm. and sear them on the grill to serve. So, you know, we were able this year by doing that to feed 80 people one inch center cut boneless pork chops. And we had about 75 cents a chop. Wow. It was our cost to feed people that way. And then people are blown away when you run an event and you do something like that. They don't expect that for lunch on the first yeah. day of a four day event. Right. That's just not what you expect. But it was like gourmet level, but it was very inexpensive because we know how to use a knife to cut a freaking single. It's all I mean, that's the easy. That's why it's an easy button. But you can play with that. So like what you'll notice is you're back to you got one long muscle, but it's really two groups. You got the rib and you got the sirloin end. So that rib end is basically the pork version of a ribeye. So there's your best chops. And then you take that first piece of the strip one, you make that a roast, and then a piece that's kind of toward the sirloin and it's not as great, slice that up and use it for stir fry. You can, but I, I'll tell you another thing where I think everybody's missing the boat on, and it's the capicola. 
if oh you just god keep, yes you just keep following that loin all the way up to the neck yeah and i'm like this is you, every time i process a pig i'll tell you where to get it from costco it won't oh, be on that it? because they because they they break it off before there Right. But another good value from Costco is the boneless pork shoulders, and they sell them in a package of two. The cap, about half the Capricola, it doesn't go all the way up the neck. It's the first piece of it is in those. And every time I buy one of those, like if I'm making deer sausage, I'll buy a pack of those because I want the, the pork for the fat to mix with the deer. And I use about 20% pork to 80% venison when I make pork sausage. Well, at the bottom of it, you'll find, or at the top of it, you'll find the Capricola. And I take those out and then I, I vacuum seal them and throw them in the freezer until I have enough of them when I'm ready to do curing. And I make actual Cap Capricola. I have a deep freezer that I've converted now that I've got a humidifier and dehumidifier. And I can't remember the company that makes it, but there's a little controller that keeps the humidity right where you want it and the temperature right where you want it. And so you cure that. And those are basically free at that. And like you said, that's a piece of meat you can't even understand. Even if you're not going to cure it, just take it out and cook the damn thing as a roast. If you, even if you cut it into steaks, which is what I do a lot hey, of times. That's time, good too. I cut, I cut that cap. If it's a big pig, it makes a really nice steak, mm -hmm. or it makes a real good cutlet. Um, I've even done it on some pretty large sheep before. Cows, I mean, that's that's something else altogether. But I'm like, how are we missing the boat on this thing? It is perfect. I don't care how lean that animal is. The Capicola is always marbled, no matter the animal. Yeah. And yeah. we're missing it. We're missing the boat here. But another, you gave me another great idea. Okay, so I base how much pork I process for the year based on how much bacon I get off of that pig. So, okay. so basically, each side of that pig... Let's say you go through a pound a week, which is nothing around here. Yeah. So you need 52 pounds for a year. Okay. If yeah. you're if you're a regular person who goes through a pound a week. Well, why couldn't you do the very same thing? If you can go to Costco and get that, can you buy pork belly? Yes, you can. Then why not? And, can, and if you go to the business center, if there's one near you, you can get it skin on. Ah. Right. And then you can make a roast skin on pork belly, but you can just definitely get it skin off and make bacon. Absolutely, you can. You could, but you could be doing some crazy stuff like porchettas or whatever else. And yeah, I mean, yeah. So you're 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 offering folks really pay attention to this because he's offering. I mean, I never really thought of doing it quite the way he does because I'm always working at a um, at a. You got so much damn meat on your land, you don't have to worry about sourcing any. I got well, three acres on a rock cliff, so I, I I'm not raising pigs and and cattle. I thought honestly when I when you presented that to me, I was like, good night, man. This is game changing. It really is because now people can take some of the skills they learn at some of our workshops and stuff like that can literally go down to the Costco, go say, okay, give me the pork. I'm going to start off easy. Yeah. Give me the pork belly. I'm going to cut it in one or two pound sections. I'm going to cure it. And then you made pancetta. Now you got pancetta. Let's turn it into bacon. Yeah. Okay. So now you, you got that under your belt. Okay. Let me go back and do what Jack was talking about and cut this thing up and get me some Denver steaks. And look, y'all, if it weighs, it pays. Don't everybody is so worried about screwing up the cuts. You yeah, know, you that was that was one thing that they taught us in going through butcher's training at this shop is that if it weighs, it pays. Look, at the end of the day, if I took this whole ribeye and I turned it into grind, I'm still money ahead. Now, yeah. you don't want to make a habit of that, but um, it, there's some really awesome – I can't, I honestly cannot believe how much money a person can save. Like you said, you spent 80 bucks for something that ordinarily would have cost you 260. So yeah, yeah. that's kind of hard to beat, man. I think it's a great idea. Well, and a lot of it has to do just with not doing the thing because it's supposed to be the thing that you do. And here's what I mean by that. A couple of weeks ago, my wife was having a bad weekend and she decided she wanted uh, beef ribs, short ribs. And we had some in the refrigerator or the freezer, but they were frozen and they take a while. So I'm like, well, they won't be ready today. So I'll, I'll run to the marketing and I go up there and the ribs are crap. I don't know what's beef short ribs used to be cheap and they had lots of meat on them. Yeah. Now they take all the meat off. They sell the meat for less than the day. It would, they would make more money leaving the meat on the bone, but they don't. And so you end up, you're paying $12 a pound for mostly bone and the meat that is there by the time you render that fat out, there's nothing left. 
Well, they had a trimmed piece of bri- a trimmed piece of brisket, and it was on sale for three ninety a pound. And I'm like, I can cut that into strips, and it had the point and the flat, and and completely trimmed. So I brought it home, took the point off it, cut the point into kind of rib shapes. Chianti braise, slow, four hours Dutch oven in the oven. And after we ate that, and I, I told, I didn't deceive her. I told her what I did. And she said, this is better than any beef rib I've ever eaten. I've never done, and I never cooked brisket that way. You got to start thinking like your grandma, or if some of you guys are a lot younger than me and Billy, you got to start thinking like great grandma, you probably never knew. And all of this stuff, a lot of the things they used to do, like short ribs or whatever, used to be stupid cheap. Now we have to find new ways to get back to stupid cheap. And we have to keep in mind, you can't base your grandma's pricing on today. What you, you think was stupid cheap back then was expensive for her too. Was that She got creative and figured out how to do these things. If we add the knife to it, we can go to a whole other level with it. And like, even if you're not breaking stuff down, if you got a business center near you, Costco, but you got to go, I think you can get, 40 pound cases of chicken thighs for 80 cents a pound. It's something around that, that range. Now you got to have something to do with 40 pounds of them. But if you do, I mean, that's cheap. And we feed our dogs chicken. We don't even feed our dogs dog food. It costs less to feed the damn dog chicken than it costs to feed them, uh, you know, Alpo. So, so why not feed your dog better? Like, you guys, you saw that video. I'm, I throw all the scrap raw to the dog. The dog, but you can't feed a dog raw meat. They should live like in nature. What, nature has kibble. What? Yeah, <laughs> a yeah, dog can... runs down a rabbit and then roasts it. Like what? Yeah. Bro, it's yeah. it's it's insane the parallels here because Michelle, right now in the kitchen every single day, my farm dog out there, all they eat is pretty much eggs and raw meat. That's what they or opal. I mean, it'll be lungs, heart, you know, you name it. That's what they eat. And the reason we get we do it that way is because that's what they feed some of the most high performance dogs on the planet, which are those dogs in the Iditarod. What do they feed them? Salmon. Basically, that's yeah, yeah. They, if you, a lot of them do. They they the, like the the lower level salmon, the ones that are not the really high desirable ones. I saw one where the guy had this like trap that just went around like a pinwheel, and every once in a while there'd be a salmon in it, and that's when he would chop all that up, boil it, and feed it to his dogs. I mean, there's so many awesome solutions out here. Like you were talking with the um, with the brisket and the point. Yeah. I mean, it's little clever. There was somebody that figured it out a long time ago. Hey, you know what? I'll smoke this whole brisket. And when it's all done, I'm going to cut the point off of it, hit it with the rub again, cut it up and make burn ends out of it. Now I'm going to get another two more bucks a pound yep. for very little work. It's yep. little things like this that we can rediscover. I know you and I are kind of nerds about this sort of thing. But I know we are going in this time where we got inflation. This just seems like it's off the chart for so many people. These are the ways to get around that stuff. Because when I saw you do that, I'm like, good night, man. I mean, this is something everybody should start learning how to do. And if you have to, just go down to your local Piggly Wiggly. Go get a whole chicken. Next time you go there, get a couple of them. And then practice that way. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like I said, you can the guy to follow on TikTok, if you're on TikTok, is Meat Dad and Bearded Butchers. And if you follow those two, you're going to end up finding other people. Uh, again, there's the one guy, it's like Nashez, or I just can't say it right. And he's a really cool dude. I, he seems like he's maybe Turkish or, or something like that, but he is a savant when it comes to chickens and you start learning all these other little things and, and working on them. I've got an episode of my podcast uh, that goes into this deeply. It's called butcher your budget with DIY meat cutting. It's episode th- 3366. It's at the survival podcast.com. Um, the notes alone have links to tutorials on YouTube. Uh, it has links to all of my equipment. Uh, that I use, um, you know, one of the things I also recommend you learn how to do, learn how to do a butcher's knot. Yes. You know, just get, I saw a guy, he had a great way of teaching it because you're not worried about the meat or whatever. He just took a rolling pin, set it on some towels so that it was elevated or roll up a dish towel or something, learn how to make a book. And it doesn't have to be perfect as long as it holds, you know, put a secure knot on the boat, just tie an overhand knot up against it. So, you know, it's going to hold, it's basically a slip knot. And, and then there's a whole 
plethora of things that you can add as to what you can do. A roast is just going to cook. I don't care if it's an eye around and it's all uniform. It's going to cook better if it's tied because it's going to stay uniform. Right. Uh, it's gonna be even, yeah. And you had it up on the screen there, but er, like there's there's a, a complete breakdown of how to break. And these aren't my videos. These are people I've learned from. Shoulder clod, top sirloin butt, uh, and some other stuff. And then there's a follow-up episode that I did a little bit later on. If you just put meat cutting in my search bar, you'll find all of that stuff. And uh, the podcasts, I think, are probably worth the price because they're free. And I know we started this today, Billy, where I was you know, kind of pitching a course because I have it out. I do want people to... I don't have anything to sell here. I mean, if you use my links and go to Amazon, I might make a, a, a quarter. Uh, the, the stuff on meat cutting, it's all free. It's just part of my podcast. It's just one of the many things we just give away. No, folks, if you're not listening to the Survival Podcast, y'all, his his breakdown of everything, I mean, he's, he's real modest, but honestly, it is... I've often said that Jack's one of the best, if not the best podcaster on the planet especially in this genre of what we do. I don't even think there's a close second. And, um, I mean, he's an absolute savant in so many doggone things, and uh, I feel lucky to know him. Jack, before we move on, man, i got to ask you, because this is an area of butchery that I know almost nothing about outside of as far as I know how to break them down, I know how to do everything else. It's when it comes to ducks. How do you process your ducks? Because honestly, what most people will do, if it's a duck hunter, they don't even want to eat it half the time. And I'm like, well, you don't know how to cook a duck if you don't know what you're doing. No, that's, that's not side of confit on the legs. What what do you how do, what do you do with it? Okay, so there's processing and cooking. So let's start out with processing. Plucking ducks sucks. Okay, so if I have one or two birds I need to cull for whatever reason. What I'll actually do, I'll take the bird, I'll dispatch it just like you do with a chicken, cut the neck, let it bleed out. I'll take the feathers dry, no, no, um, no scalding or anything, and I just the breast is actually easy to pluck. I'll pluck the breast before I take the cutlets off. I'll take a, a small butane torch and and, and burn off mm. any of the, the pin feathers that are still there before you remove it. Because the skin's going to want to shrink up on you when you do that. And then you just de-breast it. So now we haven't even opened the cavity yet. And then you can pull the skin around your thigh. And I'll pull that down to the, to the, the, the foot. Cut the foot off. And then just take the drumstick or the, the, the thigh quarter off like you do with a chicken. Just push it down, go around the oyster and take those legs off. And so all I'll take from a cold duck, because I just don't have time to do anything else, is the leg quarters and the two breast cutlets. And then the dogs can have at it, you know. Um, when I want whole ducks, if I like, if I do a meat run or something, there's a place that processes here, same place I get beef processed. I'll take them down there. He's like, well, what do you want done? Whole birds unfrozen. That's what I want. I want them plucked. I want them gutted. I want the I want the heart. I want the livers and I want the necks. They can all be in one bag, but I want them separated because otherwise they get lost. And I want the whole birds plucked. You don't want to break no. And then I bring them home and break them down myself. And so that's kind of a hybrid where I'm still willing to use my knife, but I don't want to do the crappy part of the work. You got to scald ducks at about 20 to 30 degrees hotter than chickens. And it's it's unless you're set up to do it every day. It's a pain in the rear end. Mm -hmm. But that now, cooking, breast, take the skin, score it with a double hash so you've got it one way and the other, and I'll put that down in a hot, searing hot pan, render that skin until the fat comes out of it, flip it over, and finish it in the oven to about 135 degrees where it's medium rare. The the legs, I usually do confit them. That, okay. that's, 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 that's my go-to because it's – and for folks listening that don't know, that's where we take the duck zone fat. We put it in a small like ramkin dish or whatever. We put the thighs underneath the fat and we do like 250 degrees until it falls off the bone. You pull that out, reserve that fat because you can use it over and over again. And when you go to serve that, you take that leg and you throw it into a pan and you get a little bit of sear on it. And, and that's fantastic. But that that's what I do with a duck. I've also done like duck prosciutto and stuff like that. And then sometimes if I have a bunch to cull and I don't have time to go down to place, I'll do what I said and just pull it. I'll bone the meat and then I'll throw 
about 20% pork, fatty pork in with it, throw a little bit of Armagnac in it, and I'll make duck sausage. And that stuff sells for 16, 18 bucks a pound. Wow. Right. Now I don't sell it. I eat, I'm not selling, I'm going to eat it, but um, that's fantastic. And uh, the one thing I hate about when I call it that I let the dogs have the carcasses, I don't know if you've ever eaten duck heart, but it's, it's phenomenal. Duck hearts are just delicious, right? Like I, I'm a heart guy. I like deer heart. I like duck heart. Like the, I like all heart. It's just here, the key yeah. with heart is if you overcook heart, it's such a dense muscle because it's all, it never stops. Which is why, you know, if you got the stabby stabby and you got heart damage, you got it forever because how do you heal muscle? You rest it. So you can't ever rest that muscle. Just just a side note there. And uh, so that's very fine muscle. So you want a high heat really quick, a little bit pink, and heart is freaking phenomenal. It's, it's one of the best pieces of awful. I don't consider it awful. Because offal is generally organs, and the heart technically is an organ, but a kidney is a, a pee filter, a liver is an everything else filter, a lung, it's a muscle. A heart is a muscle. It's it's biologically not any different when we break it down to that muscle than a steak or a chop to me. I don't know how you do it. Well, I don't know how anybody does it. I can't eat hearts. I can't no? eat fingers. I can't eat. No, because growing up in Pennsylvania, where we were, I kid you not, you got six you boys were. being raised by a, a widowed grandmother. And so we ate the, the bro, I'll put it this way. You ate the scraps. Yeah. So, so <laughs> guess what? She would boil gizzards. Oh, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> boil this stuff and we ate it with rice. It was like the nastiest thing to that. To this day, I can't do the livers, can't do the hearts, can't do gizzards, can't do any of it. Oh, I'll tell you how to use the liver where it won't bother you at all. One what? ounce of liver ground into every 16 ounces of ground meat. Okay. Yeah. It that actually improves the flavor. Good. You get all the new. That's what I do with my ground meat. I So if I don't have liver at the same time I'm grinding and I get a hold of liver that's worth having, I'll cube it up. If you're going to grind anything, throw it in the freaking freezer before you grind it, please. Thank you. I go so far as I take the screw out of the grinder, the plate, and the blade, and I throw them in the freezer, too, for about 30 minutes before I'm going to grind. Oh, good idea. Put it back together. I, if I'm grinding a lot, I keep a bowl of some ice cubes, and every you know, like 10 minutes of grinding, drop a couple ice cubes in it, keep it cold. And I'll, I'll take that liver, and I'll freeze that almost all the way. And I'll grind the liver, and then I'll put it in little bags of an ounce each. And when I take out a, a pound of hamburger meat, I take out one pack of liver. And when they defrost, I mix it together. And no one will ever know it's in there. If anything, it enhances flavor. And I don't like liver. I, I, I have some of your background. I'm a poor kid from PA, too, from the coal region. And there was a lot of liver in my life. And it was always cooked. My grandmother cooked any piece of meat or whatever until it couldn't stand being cooked no more. She was a Ukrainian first-generation immigrant. Her mother was from the old country. They knew a time when there was no such thing as refrigeration. You bought the piece of meat hanging in the butcher shop with the least flies on it. So they had this fear and they overcooked everything. And I had to learn on my own across time that that's not what liver spoke. I don't care though. Liver to me is that memory like you're talking about. I, uh-uh, no. Kidney, that's dog food. Yeah. It, it smells like urine. I'm not eating it. I'm, I'm just not. I'm sorry. I know somebody out there can make it taste good. You you can have all the kidneys you want. I'll give them to you. Yeah, I'm with you on that. When it, I, I will say though, there is something about mixing a little bit of liver into your grind that just sets that flavor profile in a way that it you don't taste. I can't stand liver, but there's something yep. it does. It's the best burger I think I ever make. Yep. Whenever it goes in there. So um, it loses like, that minerally thing. And the other thing is any is also grind any sausage. Yeah. You know, it, it, again, it, it's, it, if you look at like if you do a whole pig and you're going to make you're going to go sausage heavy with all of the trim and you take all the trim from one pig to one liver, you're looking at maybe five percent of the volume. You're not going to taste liver, but there is something it does. And I don't know what it is that enhances the flavor. And I don't even know what the percentage is where it would kick over to like, it tastes like liver because I've never gotten close to it. I don't plan on it. Yeah. I'm right there with you. Well, Jack, it's, it's been a joy to have you on and thanks yeah, everybody for being here tonight. Where, where can, once again, where can everybody get a hold of your course? 
Yeah. So the composting course, you can find that at homefoodsystems.com, homefoodsystems.com. If you happen to be listening to this tonight, because I put it out on social media and you're one of my folks and you're in my member program, remember there's a $5 discount for you guys. If you go get the code, I'm not retroactively doing it. Um, my main website is the survivalpodcast.com. Today we did something like episode 3,439. Uh, so we've been around a while. I've been podcasting since uh, 2008 and I've been full time since 2010. Uh, today we were talking about Bitcoin. So uh, it's a very varied podcast. I hate to compare myself to Joe Rogan, but it's kind of like that in that you don't know what you're going to get one day to the next, though we are themed self-sufficient, self-reliancy, uh, self, self-sufficiency, self self-reliance, independence, and liberty. Uh, and our tagline is helping you live a better life if times get tough or even if they don't. That that was a really good tagline in 2008. I think now it's helping you live a better life because times are getting tough. You got that right, bro. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for uh, checking us out tonight. Remember, go check out the Survival Survivor Survival Podcast. Good night. I'm well, we're both up. hungry. We're ready to go eat dinner. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're fumbling our words. And by the way, hi, Eka Mouse. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> hey, thanks, everybody, for checking us out, man. Thanks a lot, Jack. Take care, Billy. We'll see you.